So uh, it's a pleasure for me to be here and Pat and have a chance to participate in your 90th birthday celebration. Um, I came to Stanford uh, in 1966, so I haven't known Pat as long as some other people. I mean, maybe I'm 10th on the list or whatever it is. Um, in any event, I spent a lot of time in Ventura Hall, and this is a, a, a kind of a well-known photograph that was taken of people who were part of mathematical psychology. Pat should have been there in the photo, but for some reason he was missing that day, and his name appears in the a list of people who are, are missing. But you do see a number of other people who um, were very close to Pat. Uh, so there's Bill Estes, who was mentioned earlier by Pat in this symposium, the student of Skinner's, and uh, there's Dick Atkinson, and uh, there's Gordon Bauer, who was a young uh, professor at Stanford, and here he is in the audience uh, still uh, again today honoring Pat. So uh, I joined a uh, group that I didn't quite fit in very well with, but um, let's see, how do I advance this? down arrow. <coughs> All right, I'm getting the down arrow in this space. Space. Yeah. <coughs> oh, there. Okay. So, uh, but wh uh, whatever, there I am. Uh, and you can see times were, were very different at, uh, at that point. I, I came to Stanford and started working uh, with Dick Atkinson and uh, finished my master's thesis, but then began working with Pat on uh, computer-assisted instruction and mathematics education. Uh, and, I mean, I, I was very intimidated by him uh, because this is his uh, uh, academic lineage. And, uh, in fact, at that point, I, I don't think I was allowed to call him Pat until after I had gotten my PhD. So it was always uh, Dr. Soupies or Professor Soupies uh, to me uh, during that time. Now, we did write a couple of papers together, uh, and so here's one of them, published in 1969. Uh, here's another uh, paper that we published together in the Journal of Educational Psychology. Um, I do have to say I just uh, accessed Google Scholar to find out that um, this paper has been cited 50 times. Uh, nowhere Near Foundations of Measurement, which was published around the same time, which has been cited at least 2,500 times. So I have not done very much for Pat's citation count. However, it was enough to get my PhD and to be uh, added to uh, this uh, illustrious lineage. And for the other uh, Pat Soupy students, if You'd like to have a copy of this and pluck out me at the bottom and put yourself in. <laughs> uh, I then, uh, oh, by the way, uh, I was uh, my, started my career in New York City, and um, the the paper, the Journal of Ed Psych paper that's been cited 50 times. Uh, was something that we worked on after I'd already moved to New York, and one of my, um, you know fondest memories of Pat is he was so busy uh, doing other kinds of things that he had to do in New York that um, the only time we had to work on the paper was while he was taking the taxi from Manhattan to Idlewild, now known as Kennedy Airport, uh, at which time we would work in the back of the taxi and then he would hand me the money to give the taxi driver to take me back into the city. <laughs> but we did, we did get that, that paper done. Um, at this point, um, I departed from, um, I guess, my intellectual roots, although I continued to use uh, many things that I've learned from Pat, like uh, multiple regression and stepwise regression and to apply them to other problems. Um, but I got very interested in legal cases. And so throughout the last 40 years, I have devoted a lot of uh, attention to legal cases and considered the application of my scientific work to, to legal cases. I'm particularly interested in two classes of cases. The cases where a crime really happened, a murder, a rape, whatever it is, uh, somebody's been identified as the person who committed the crime, uh, and we now know that 
there are a growing number of cases of wrongful conviction. People who spent 5, 10, 15, or more years in prison uh, for crimes that we know now they didn't do because DNA testing has shown they are actually innocent. And when these cases have been analyzed, the major cause responsible in 75 to 80 percent of the cases is faulty human memory, faulty eyewitness testimony, and so I've been studying that issue. Then in the last 20 years or so, I got very interested in these repressed memory accusations. And I want to be very clear what I'm talking about here when I talk about the repressed memory accusations. I'm not talking about a person who's known her whole life that she was molested, or he, and maybe 20, 30 years later got the courage to tell a friend or a trusted therapist about it. I'm talking about one specific kind of situation, and I think this family exemplifies that situation. The dad, Gary Ramona, was an executive with the Mondavi Winery. When his world came crashing down, his daughter went into therapy, and there she learned something she never knew before, namely that her father allegedly raped her between the ages of 5 and 16, forced her into many rapes, sex with the family dog, all allegedly repressed into her unconscious until this therapy made her aware of it. Um, from my analysis of a, of a vast attempt to document this or find support for the idea of repression, there is no credible scientific support. And yet these kinds of accusations were being brought in criminal and civil cases by the hundreds and hundreds uh, over the last couple of decades. And as I would be involved as an expert witness in some of these cases and listen to some of the bizarre memory stories that were being uh, offered as, as uh, evidence in these cases, I was prompted to rewrite that solemn oath that witnesses take when they get on the stand. I think this is a much more apt oath that, that witnesses should be swearing to tell the truth, the whole truth, or whatever they think they remember. But so far, I have, much as I've been pushing this, it hasn't caught on yet. So, I've developed a couple of paradigms that I think map into these two kinds of court cases. First, there's the misinformation paradigm, as it's now known in the literature. And here, experimental subjects come in, they see an event, might be a simulated crime or an accident, they get some post-event information about what they saw, and then they're tested. And that post-event information is typically misleading in some way. And I think that taps into the first kind of case where there are memory errors. But there really is an event that happened. There really was a rape. There really was a murder. Um, but to map into this other kind of case, where a, a person is coming up with like 10 years of, of brutalization and forced bestiality, um, we needed to go a little further and, and try to plant rich false memories, <coughs> as they're now called. And to do this, we don't start with an event. Uh, but we ply people with suggestions about their past, and then we test them to see what they remember about their childhood or about their more recent past. And so for that first type of paradigm, one of my earliest studies uh, that you can often read about in introductory psychology textbooks today, we showed people a simulated accident where a car goes through an intersection with a stop sign, and by asking a single leading question that insinuates that it was a yield sign and not a stop sign, we get lots and lots of people to believe and remember they saw this scene. Even when the truth is staring them in the face, they choose the scene that corresponds to the misinformation. <clears throat> and so now I've given you a brief summary of 35 years of research on the misinformation effect. If people see an event and get misinformation about it, it impairs their memory performance. But to now turn uh, to that second type of case, um, the many cases that have been tried in court where people have developed these very, very rich and detailed false memories, rich, detailed memories of being forced into satanic rituals, 
or sometimes rich and detailed memories of things. They don't get into court cases, but things like uh, being abducted by aliens and taken up on spaceships. There are actually a lot of people who have such um, memories. We needed to find a way to plant richer false memories, not just tinker with the detail here and there. So how are you going to do that? You're not going to be able to get it through the Human Subjects Review Committee.